What's your name? The boss asks. George Milton. And what's yours? George said, his name's Lenny Small. The names were entered in the book. Let's see. This is the 20th, noon the 20th. He closed the book. Where you boys been working? Up around Weed. That's the name of the town. Now in chapter one, we get some details about the fact that Lenny caused some trouble in the previous town, and they had to leave very quickly. See, we learn that Lenny uh, very much likes to pet soft animals, and um, it turns out that that need to touch soft things uh, transitioned to, to Lenny touching, innocently touching a woman's dress, but of course the woman not understanding Lenny's intellectual disabilities um, was frightened and, and thought that, you know, the he was up to no good and, and they had to leave. Now, of course, George doesn't want to tell the boss the truth, so he's going to have to lie to cover for himself and Lenny uh, so that they can get this job. His name's Lenny Small. Where you boys been working? Up around Weed, said George. You too, to Lenny? Yeah, him too, said George. The boss pointed a playful finger at Lenny. He ain't much of a talker, is he? No, he ain't, but he's sure a hell of a good worker, strong as a bull. Lenny smiled to himself. Strong as a bull, he repeated. George scowled at him, and Lenny dropped his head in shame at having forgotten. The boss said suddenly, Listen, small. Lenny raised his head. What can you do? In a panic, Lenny looked back at George for help. He can do anything you tell him, said George. He's a good skinner. He can wrestle grain bags, drive a cultivator. He can do anything. Just give him a try. The boss turned to George. Then why don't you let him answer? What are you trying to put over? George broke in loudly. Oh, I ain't saying he's bright. He ain't. But I say he's a goddamn good worker. He can put up a 400-pound bail. The boss deliberately put the little book in his pocket. He looked his thumbs in his belt and squinted one eye nearly closed. Say, what are you selling? So here we can clearly see, based on the description of the character's actions in the dialogue, that the boss is suspicious of George and Lenny, as he should be. I mean, Lenny's, uh, George is not telling him the full truth about their situation. Huh? I said, what stake you got in this guy? You taking his pay away from him? So here the boss thinks that George is scamming Lenny, that George is uh, basically controlling Lenny and taking his pay. This is interesting because one of the major themes of this book is friendship and companionship, and we're going to encounter many characters who don't understand why George and Lenny are such close friends, and they don't value the companionship. A lot of the ranchers are going to be described as lonesome, having no one and no place to call home, and uh, that is... Um, like, as I said, one of the major themes of the work is we're going to find with all of the characters. No, of course I ain't. What do you think I'm selling him out? Well, I never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. i just like to know what your interest is. George said, he's my cousin. I told his old lady I'd take care of him. He got kicked in the head by a horse when he was a kid. He's all right, just ain't bright, but he can do anything you tell him. Now, Lenny was not kicked by a horse. He was born with intellectual disabilities. But, you know, that kind of um, mental disability was not well understood at the time the book was published, 1937. So, um, you know, it, it wouldn't have been as, as accepted or as understood. So George has to come up with this lie that Lenny was kicked in the head by a mule. And that, I guess, maybe caused some kind of brain damage or something. He's all right, just ain't bright, but he can do anything you tell him. The boss turned half away. Well, God knows you don't need any brains to buck barley bags, but don't you try to put nothing over, Milton. I got my eye on you. Why'd you quit in weed? Job was done, said George promptly. What kind of job? We, we was digging a cesspool. All right, but don't try to put nothing over, because you can't get away with nothing. I seen wise guys before. Go on out with the grain teams after dinner. They're picking up barley at the thrashing machines. Go out with Slim's team. Slim? Yeah, big tall Skinner. You'll see him at dinner. He turned abruptly, went to the door. But before he went out, he turned and looked for a long moment at the two men. When the sound of his footsteps had died away, George turned on Lenny. So you wasn't going to say a word. You was going to leave your big flapper shut and let me do all the talking. Damn near lost us the job. Lenny stared hopelessly at his hands. I forgot, George. 
Yeah, you forgot. You always forgot, and I gotta talk you out of it. He sat down heavily on the bunk. Now he's got his eye on us. Now we gotta be careful and not make no slips. You keep your big flapper shut after this. He fell morosely silent. So now there's a lot of foreshadowing going on here, and foreshadowing happens a lot in this book. Foreshadowing is when an author... Um, is strongly suggesting that something bad is going to happen in the future, usually by establishing a pattern or something that has already gone wrong. We see that George and Lenny had a problem at Weed. Uh, you know, the, the boss is suspicious of them. It's not off to a good start, right? That uh, things, things aren't going great so far, and that strongly implies through foreshadowing that something bad is going to happen. George... What do you want now? I wasn't kicked in the head with no horse, was I, George? Oh, that's really sad. Be a damn good thing if you was, George said viciously. Save everybody a hell of a lot of trouble. So here we have the internal conflict of George, right? He he really does love Lenny and wants to take care of him. He promised the, promised Lenny's aunt that he, was, that he would take care of him. Lenny does provide some benefit with the fact that he's like a really good worker. But, um, you know, George is constantly sort of dragged down by Lenny and he's express he's not afraid to express that um, resentment directly to Lenny. You said I was your cousin, George. Well that was a lie, and I am damn glad it was. If I was a relative of yours, I'd shoot myself. He stopped suddenly, stepped to the open front door and peered out. Say, what the hell are you doing listening? The old man came slowly into the room. He had his broom in his hand, and his heels there walked a drag-footed sheepdog, gray of muzzle and with pale, blind old eyes. The dog struggled lamely to the side of the room and lay down, grunting softly to himself and licking his grizzled, moth-eaten coat. So this is the description of a um, dog that is pretty, uh, it's not in good shape, it's old, it's blind. Uh, it's the old man's dog, it's um, the swamper's dog. And um, he's going to be an important symbol in the text, as, as we learn later. The swamper watched him until he was settled. I wasn't listening. I was just standing in the shade a minute, scratching my dog. I just now finished swamping out the wash house. You was poking your big ears into our business, George said. I don't like nobody get no nosy. The old man looked uneasily from George to Lenny and then back. I just come there, he said. I didn't hear nothing you guys were saying. I ain't interested in nothing you was saying. A guy in a ranch don't ever listen, nor he don't ask no questions. Damn right he don't, said George, slightly mollified. Not if he wants to stay working long. But he was reassured by the swamper's defense. Come on in and sit down a minute, he said. That's a hell of an old dog. Yeah, I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheepdog when he was younger. He stood his broom against the wall and he rubbed his white bristled cheek with his knuckles. How'd you like the boss? He said, he asked. Pretty good, seemed all right. He's a nice fellow, the swamper agreed. You gotta take him right. At that moment, a young man came into the muck. Now we have a new character. All right, so let's take a moment to stop and just take stock of the an inventory of the characters, okay? So we've got George and Lenny. We've got the boss. We have the swamper who's an old man with the old dog. Now, the Swamper is uh, his most prominent characterization feature is that he's missing a hand. That's going to be important. The, his old dog kind of symbolizes him. They're both, you know, they used to be more valuable than they are now, but they're, they're um, being kept around through sympathy. Uh, let's see. We also have the uh, Stable Buck, who is a black man, um, and, you know, because, because of racism not treated well by the others. Now we're going to be introduced to a new and interesting character. There's some questions about this character uh, on the handout, so make sure to pay attention here. At that moment, a young man came into the bunkhouse. A thin young man with a brown face, with brown eyes, and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and, like the boss, he wore high-heeled boots. See my old man, he asked. The swamper said, he was just here a minute ago. Curly went over to the cookhouse, I think. I'll try to catch him, said Curly. His eyes passed over the new men, and he stopped. He glanced coldly at George and then at Lenny. 
His arms gradually bent at the elbows, and his head closed into fists. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. That means ready to fight. Lenny squirmed under the look and shifted his feet nervously. Curly stepped gingerly close to him. You the new guys the old man was waiting for? So here, Curly is characterized very strongly as being um, confrontational. We just come in, said George. Let the big guy talk. Lenny twisted with embarrassment. George said, suppose he don't want to talk. Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's got to talk when he spoke to. What the hell are you getting into it for? We travel together, said George coldly. Oh, so it's that way? George was tense and motionless. Yeah, it's that way. Lenny was looking helplessly to George for instruction. And you won't let the big guy talk? Is that it? He can talk if he wants to tell you anything. He nodded slightly to Lenny. Okay, you can talk a little bit. We just come in, Lenny said softly. Curly stared levelly at him. Well, next time you answer when you spoke to. He turned toward the door and walked out, and his elbows were still bent out a little. George watched him out, and then he turned back to the swamper. Say, what the hell's he's got in his shoulder? Lenny didn't do nothing to him. The old man looked cautiously at the door to make sure no one was listening. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight, and he's handy. Well, let him be handy, said George. He don't have to take after Lenny. Lenny didn't do nothing to him, but he's got against Lenny. The swamper considered, well, tell you what. Curly's like a lot of little guys. He hates big guys. He's all the time picking scraps with big guys, kind of like he's mad at him because he ain't a big guy. You see little guys like that, ain't you? Always scrappy. So here, um, Lenny, uh, the swamper describes Curly as being handy, in the ring. These are boxing terms. This is uh, related to the fact that Curly uh, likes to fight. He's scrappy. And uh, according to the Swamper, he likes to fight the big guys to show how tough he is. Sure, said George. I seen plenty tough little guys. But this Curly better not make no mistakes about Lenny. Lenny ain't handy. But this Curly punk is gonna get hurt if he messes around with Lenny. Well, Curly's pretty handy. The Swamper said skeptically. Never did seem right to me. Suppose Curly jumps a big guy and licks him. Everybody says what a game guy Curly is. And suppose he does the same thing and gets licked. Then everybody says the big guy ought to pick on somebody his own size. And maybe they gang up on the big guy. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't giving nobody a chance. George was washing the door. He said ominously. Well, he better watch out for Lenny. Lenny ain't no fighter, but Lenny's strong and quick. And Lenny don't know no rules. He walked to the square table and sat down on one of the boxes. He gathered some of the cards together and shuffled them. So here uh, we're more foreshadowing. Uh, we're clearly strongly implying that there's going to be some kind of altercation between Lenny and Curly. The old man sat down on another box. Don't tell Curly I said none of this. He'd sloth me. He's just don't give a damn. Won't ever cancel. Oh, excuse me. Won't ever get canned because his old man's the boss. Aha. So Curly sort of has the protection and is able to behave this badly because his old man, his father, is the boss. George cut the cards and began turning them over, looking at each one and throwing it down on a pile. He said, this guy Curly sounds like a son of a bitch to me. I don't like mean little guys. Seems to me like he's worse lately. And the Swamper, he got married a couple weeks ago. Excuse me. S uh, the Swamper says, seems to me like he's worse lately. He got married a couple of weeks ago. Wife lives over in the boss's house. Seems like Curly is cockier than ever since he got married. George grunted. <laughs> Maybe he's showing off for his wife. The Swamper warmed to his gossip. You seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah, I seen it. Well, that glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I tell you what. Curly says he's keeping that hand soft for his wife. George studied the cards absorbedly. That's a dirty thing to tell around, he said. The old man was reassured. He had drawn a derogatory statement from George. He felt safe now. And he spoke more confidently. Where do you see Curly's wife? George cut the cards again and put the solitaire laid down and deliberately. Purdy? He asked casually. Yeah, Purdy. But, George studied the cards. But what? Well, she got the eye. Yeah, married two weeks and got the eye? Maybe that's why Curly's pants is full of ants. So, a couple things. One, 
George is playing solitaire, which is uh, symbolic of the loneliness that the characters experience through the book. Solitaire is a card game played with one player. Um, and here we're characterizing Curly's wife as having the eye, meaning she is, uh, she's flirtatious, and that's how she's going to be characterized through the book. Um, it's an, important to take a um, feminist read of, of literature in the 21st century, and we would say that Curly's wife is not the strongest uh, or, or um, best rendered uh, individual in terms of a female character, and that's going to be evident throughout the text.